I love circles. They are beautiful, but they're also very complete. And there is this idea that the start is also the end. And that's quite powerful. It's quite a good thing to let go. Um, we've built very large structures uh, in very adverse conditions in the desert. We've built a temple, a secular temple, uh, with 140 people in 18 days in the desert from modular components that people would learn about and would build together. Um, and there's this uh, quote that kept on resonating in my mind as we were building it uh, from the founder of Burning Man, uh, which says that community emerge not by just mere goodwill, but through shared struggle. And we felt, we felt that struggle. It was hard. It was hard, but collectively hard. I think we all admitted to each other that this is not going to be easy, that we're building in the <laughs> worst place to be building something. Um, but there was this sense of um, what happens next, you know? As we invent a city, reinvent it, build it, unbuild it, leave no trace, what happens to things after we design them? Where do they come from? Where do they go? And that notion, I thought, was really interesting beyond, of course, this event. Um, and that's why I brought my students. I uh, brought my students to Burning Man in order to learn about not just design, but actually um, how to be together and how to build stuff together. And, and this sort of uh, became even more uh, kind of emphasized when we built that temple, Galaxia. You can see around it uh, lots of people interacting with it. The build didn't stop at the opening, so to speak. It started as a journey together, and it continued onwards up to now. And it was a, um, a secular temple, which I think resonates a lot because you can see that lots of stuff are placed in there, and everyone could relate to that shared struggle. Everyone can relate with everyone else's struggle. And, and I think that's a really powerful universal message. Um, so we brought a lot uh, of it back. This is our office in Hackney, uh, East London. And we're an office of architecture, but we also, beyond that, have a fabrication space. And that's really, really core and very important, because I really feel like we need to break the divide between design and making, and it's, it's crucial uh, in today's world, because it means that whatever we create is the thing itself. It's not a representation of it, it's not um, you know, a kind of abstract thing, it is the thing. And if it's the thing, you have no choice. You have to confront the thing. Where are the materials from? You know, how, does it, how do you even make it? How does it stand up? How does it fail? And, and that notion of failure is super important to accept. And I think we struggle with it as designers. And just as people, we buy perfect products. You know, we are consumers. And that, I thought, could be changed through 3D printing. 3D printing is... Of course, I'm sure you all know what it is now. But what it is really, it's a tool to which you can send files, and they can print stuff locally, layer by layer, using materials that you can control. And in our case, I'm sure you can see around stuff, it's all made from sugar. And I think that's really, really important, because you can grow sugar. You can grow starch. and um, and we usually mine plastic. We mine plastic, but we don't grow stuff. And plastic is everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Even inside us. And this is polylactic acid. It's similar to what you produce when you have a stitch, when you run, around, when you run around and you have a stitch. And so it can compost. It can disappear and go back to the earth. We are often kind of trained to see things as objects, you know, as a sort of branded, finished, perfect thing. It's, it's very common. <laughs> you see it everywhere when you shop, you want this perfect product. But really, when you started being involved in design, what you're developing are their systems. They're not final forms. 
And you can see here, it's a stool, it's a lamp, it's a partition, what is it? You know? And so, when you start thinking in systems, you activate your imagination, you activate your creativity. And that's crucial, because if you're involved in the way things are made, and you can control the parameters behind it, then you are empowered to become the creator, and you're part of that. And I think that's really important to um, reconnect ourselves to the materials, to the techniques, and there's something called parametric design. Maybe some of you have heard about it. It's when you can change parameters. It's a bit of a little revolution because we are designing with systems. So imagine yourself having the ability to customize stuff, but not just change the color, change the shape, understand the DNA of things around you. And so our team is having fun. Uh, I love, well, number one, I love my team, but second of all, it's a really interesting thing when you're confronted on a daily basis with what's around you. And so that's why I think it's really important to, um, to create this direct relationship, almost like a craft between you and what you see. So we call it digital craft, and it can be sugar, it could be clay, it could be other materials that are circular in the sense that they can go back to the earth, that's this notion of cradle to cradle. But beyond that, beyond the material, beyond the technology, we're starting to think in modular ways. What if you can build an unbuild skyscraper? What if you could build and unbuild anything around you? What if everything was made of little building blocks that pushes your imagination to come up with stuff? And what if you had access to an entire network of places down the road where you can bring your bottle and create something new. And that's a little bit beyond just the purchase, right? And it's a little bit beyond the consumption. You're actually encouraged to go in a space where you can put your bottle and like, create something from it and see the entire life cycle. So there's a little geek geeky graph here, um, which is called a life cycle assessment. Often we think something is better or it's worse. You know, some say, oh, that's a bad thing. It's a bad thing for the environment. What does that mean? What, bad in terms of what? Like, which axis? Which dimensions? There are so many dimensions around things, you know? And so a life cycle assessment on this material, PLA, shows that, for example, it's very bad for land use, right? It's about 80% more efficient than petroleum plastic in terms of carbon. But it's very bad for land use, of course. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is infrastructure. So, vertical farm, composting facility, that's what we need to think of. Beyond just what we see, what we hear, we inquire, we dig the issues, and we try and solve them together. And so we push, every project is a big mission. This was at the Design Museum, part of the Waste Age exhibition, and we tried to use off-the-shelf material, scaffolding poles, etc., rough stuff, and this sort of slightly more precious, but still very rough, uh, bioplastic. And what was really nice is because we used up the shelf component, we could measure the carbon. Imagine if you could design in your computer, in your interfaces, and as you design, one of the parameters that you can visualize live is carbon. That would be amazing, because then you not only consider the price of stuff and the way things are assembled, but also the environmental price. There's a really deep disconnection between the financial price of things in terms of economics, plastic is cheap, and the environmental cost of stuff. And if we start having metrics, not just greenwashing, not just big words, but metrics, then we can act. And that's empowerment too. There's also a really inherent contradiction between the biodegradable and the durable, right? We want facades made of mushroom, and then when they start having, a, you know, like a, a rot, we're like, ah, oh, why am I facade rotting? Well, it's made of mushroom. And, um, <laughs> and so that's the problem. If your chair starts to degrade, if you're sitting on it, that's not great. I mean, you could hurt yourself. And so there's a real inherent contradiction that 
I think some materials can help if they can be activated, if the biodegradability can be activated, which is why I love PLA, because it only will compost under certain conditions, and otherwise, it is really strong. In some metrics, even stronger than plastics. So, there is the material, and then there is also the geometry. I'm sure you know you've held an egg in your hand, and you know how fragile an egg is, because you have to go like that to break it apart. But actually, an egg is pure curvature. And the more curvature you have, the stronger something is, the less you need material. And it's a really important notion because, because it's not just about the material. If I give you a biomaterial and you just use tons of it, then we haven't succeeded, right? So we need to think in that holistic manner. And you'll see curvature everywhere. You'll see circles within circles within circles. You know, it's not just because I love circles and fractals. It's also because it really helps reduce. Reduce, reuse, repurpose, all the notions of circular economy. We're also obsessed with 3D printing, and I'm sure this talk is helping to some extent this uh, fascination. I'm fascinated. But we need to kind of zoom out a little bit into the real revolution, which is digital fabrication. Digital fabrication includes laser cutting, CNC machining, um, all these tools that used to be in factories very, very far and are now in our office or down the road. And that's crazy. That means you can actually design internationally and produce locally. You reduce transportation, you can create flat pack components, assemble them as modules. How amazing is that? And so when you think of, you know, not just 3D stuff, but 2D going to 3D, you switch dimension. And so you can actually cut stuff into becoming strong. I'm sure you've heard origamis are extremely strong because they add ridges to something that's otherwise very flat. This is a 0.8 millimeter sheet that became really strong through folding. Or you can use a 3D printer like a laser cutter by printing flat and assembling into complex geometry. This is an homage to stone tracery, um, a kind of ancestral art in the cathedral, and we blend the bioplastic with metal and also with additives, like fireproofing, because that is a big issue. So switching to a much larger scale, we're working on facades, and we're thinking of the module itself. You know, should we have a huge robot that prints everything in one go? Is that even possible to the size of skyscraper? Probably not. So we cannot escape modularity. And in that sense, from here to here, it's going to be quite a jump. We're going to build this and hopefully be you know, one of the first examples of its kind where we can print locally a very, very large structure. And we'll also set up spaces around the world. This is um, probably one of the first international fab pub, which will be in, in Bucharest within a structure that is uh, following in the principles of, of circularity. And I really, really hope that you'll join our uh, effort and that you'll feel empowered to also change things. Thank you very much.